Got a little more room up there. I know this may sound quirky and it's just me, but it has bugged me for years that my stage is so high. I know a lot of you have probably gotten used to it. I've always felt like I wanted to be a little closer, a little lower, so um, doing that today. So we're going to give it a try for a while. If we don't like it, um, we'll, we'll give it back to you. But anyway, appreciate Phil doing that. Stand with me if you would this morning, and let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Gracious God, you are so good. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning that we have. Lord, we do thank you for the rain. We thank you for the break in the rain. And we thank you, God, for all your many blessings that you poured out on us. But more than anything, we thank you for every spiritual blessing we have in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. We thank you, Lord, for our redemption. We thank you, God, that we have been born again to a new and living hope. We thank you, God, that we have a, a Savior that loves us and that, that tells us to come boldly before his throne, that we may obtain mercy and find help in our time of need. Lord, we could go on and on and on this morning just counting our blessings, but we just want to thank you and praise you, and we have the opportunity to do that corporately this morning. So we're asking for your help. We're praying for your Holy Spirit to speak powerfully into our lives. Um, just guide us, lead us. I pray for your help this morning in preaching your word. May you be glorified, and may the church be edified. We love you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey, get around and greet one another if you would. Sunday the 6th, and Chad said, well, why don't you let me speak for you that Sunday, and that way you can really enjoy your vacation and all that, and I don't know that I've ever done that before, um, but I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to give it a try. Um, it's usually when I'm on vacation, I always spend a good portion of my vacation time prepping for that next Sunday sermon, which I love to do. I mean, I, it's not a problem at all, but it'll be neat to kind of have a vacation where I'm not prepping for that sermon coming back, so I appreciate Chad and his willingness to stand in and do that. So, on three, we're going to give one clap to both these guys. You ready? One, two, three. There you go. It's all on you. That was great. I have, so I'm pretty sure I heard. My hearing's not great, but I think when you said you're going to be on vacation, I'm pretty sure I heard somebody else start to clap, so yeah. you got to clap too this morning. Hey, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. A couple things you need to do. Good morning. Good morning. Audience participation. Uh, couple things you need to be aware of, all right? One, ladies, your luncheon is today, and uh, Steve prepared plenty of food, so even if you didn't <coughs> sign up, you can still come. They'll have plenty for you, so show up. Uh, don't not come because you think Steve prepared. He did, so you can come. You're safe for all right. Uh, sixth graders, well, any middle schoolers, right? So we met with the middle school parents, uh, not middle school parents, parents of middle schoolers. That sounds a little better. Um, a little awkward there. Uh, 
going to be finalizing our, our summer calendar for, for middle school students. So if you're at that meeting, be watching for that. If you weren't at that meeting, uh, if you have a child uh, middle school, including sixth graders, if you just finished sixth grade, be watching for that. We're excited about doing some stuff with the middle schoolers this summer. Uh, high schoolers will be meeting at 6 o'clock tonight, so be sure to be there. Bring a friend. Uh, bring somebody who's not your friend. We don't care. We'll, 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 they're welcome. Uh, if you uh, have experience playing the drums, if you're musically inclined, you keep a beat, like to play the drums, uh, the worship team would love uh, for you to maybe try it out for a couple weeks. Meet with Jason over here. He'd love to get with you. Um, if you've played the drums before, don't show me like, hey, I think I might do it. Try it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, that's, that's not who we're interested in, in seeing the right? So, uh, But we'd love to add that, uh, just that extra element uh, to worship on Sunday mornings. Uh, so ladies, lunch of today, ladies, Bible study this Wednesday at 530. Be sure to be here. And then also this Wednesday at 6.30, we're going to be having our Wednesday night meal, all right? So here's what's really important about that. If you don't typically come on Wednesday nights, uh, but you're coming this week because there's food, uh, that's fine. You're welcome. Uh, just let Lori know so they kind of have a, an idea on how many to prepare for this week. Um, I think that's it. Did I miss something? Uh, I think that's it. So uh, stand with me. Let's pray. And let's ask God uh, to just uh, be with us this morning. God, we thank you, and God, just again, for, for another opportunity to, to come into your house this morning and to go and join together, and God, just to unite our voices as we, as, we, as we praise you, as we lift up your name, God, and, uh, because it's, it's you alone that are worthy of our praise, and God, I pray that this morning that regardless of what's going on in our lives right now, regardless of the kind of week that we've had this morning, God, we're here to celebrate you, and that God, we would just allow our hearts to be open in our ears and minds to be open to what you have to speak to us this morning. And so God, as we worship you this morning just through song, God, I pray that you just hear the cries of our heart and, uh, and just the, the words that we sing out of our mouth, that God, it would just be a reflection of the attitude in our hearts, God. And, uh, we just lift you up this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
cross of Christ because it is only there that we find your amazing grace. And Lord, we're here this morning and we are witnesses of that great and amazing grace that was poured out in our hearts when we placed our faith in Christ. And I'm asking this morning that we would just celebrate that grace once again as we come into your word. And Lord, I'm also praying that if there's anybody here this morning or perhaps joining us online or listening this morning that and that they've not experienced that great, amazing grace of our God, I'm asking that you would flood their hearts with it this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would bring conviction, or that you would bring comfort, or that you would bring both. I just ask, Lord, that you would do the work that only you can do this morning. Uh, comfort the, the, the saint, convict the sinner. Lord, do the work that only you can do in our hearts. We thank you once again for this time of worship. We thank you that we have the opportunity to open up your word together this morning, to rightly divide this word of truth. I pray your anointing upon me, and I just ask that this word will go forth and accomplish everything you send it forth to accomplish. Let it find good ground for this good seed today. We love you, we praise you, and we ask all this again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. We'll let our ushers come forward this morning and give you an opportunity to worship the Lord in your giving. Bow your hands with me if you would. Gracious God, we've been so blessed as a church for these many years, Lord. You just continue to pour out your blessings upon us in many ways. And one of those is financially. I thank you for the way that you have moved on people's hearts uh, to give freely in this church. And I pray that it is always, I pray that they do it always in a spirit of joy. And I'm asking this morning that you move on our hearts once again. Uh, for those of us that have been just blessed financially, may we be a blessing now uh, to this church and to the many ministries that this uh, money funds and takes care of. I thank you, Lord, that we're even able to do more as a church body now uh, than we used to just because of the faithful giving of the saints. So continue to move on their hearts. Be glorified now in this offering. And again, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, we appreciate our worship team. Give me a big hand. We will cut out the kids for Kids Church. The little ones head on out the door. We thank you for those that are helping out in this ministry and making this possible. Once again, um, we would love to have, if, you can, if you're looking for a place to get plugged in here at Church in Action, we would love to have you join us in our kids' ministry. Probably the, one of the most important ministries we have going here at our church. So. Grab your Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. As we continue our study of Luke's orderly account. Today, I believe, is week 56 we've been in this study. It's hard to believe we've been in this 56 studies already. I want to pick up uh, today where we left off last week, which was verse 4 of chapter 12. And we're just going to look at verses 4 through 7. Jesus is pulls his disciples aside here and he says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I'll warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. 
Well, I'm only covering these three or four verses this morning because there's some interesting stuff here, and we're really going to do more of a thematic study this morning than just a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of this. But Luke's account here brings us to some interesting things that Jesus has to say, and um, a, a passage that's been debated by a lot of scholars over the years. What's interesting here is Jesus actually tells his disciples, and he calls them friends, so we know this is kind of a warm, fuzzy moment. Jesus pulls his disciples aside and he says, hey, buddy, listen, hey, friends, I want you to hear this. He tells his disciples that they are actually to be fearful of someone. Doesn't come right out and say who, but he says, you should be fearful of someone. Now, the interesting thing about that is I thought the Bible tells us to fear not, right? Matter of fact, there's somebody has said that the, 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 the term fear not is mentioned 365 times in the Bible, one time for every day of the year. And then some other author came along and said, well, I counted them up. There's actually 366. And someone else said, well, that's because you got fear in a leap. I don't know. I've never fact-checked this. I don't know if it really says fear not 365 times. But I do think it's safe to say our Lord does not want us walking in fear. He says the just shall live by faith. But in today's text, Jesus tells his disciples to not fear someone and then to absolutely fear someone else. So I want to look at that for just a second. Verse 4, he says, do not fear who? Don't fear the one who can kill the body. Who has the power to kill our bodies? Anybody, really. Somebody want to come in here this morning and go crazy on us? They could take our lives. This would have applied to anybody that was either threatening the disciples or maybe Jesus was thinking ahead of those who are going to be threatening the disciples. We know almost every one of the, the 12 disciples were either martyred or uh, uh, died a horrible death in some way or another. So he's probably referring to the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, who he had just woed in the previous passage. You remember in our last study, Jesus said, oh, woe to you scribes, woe to you Pharisees. He woed all over, right? He had some very stringent things, very strict, straightforward things he was trying to say to them. And then he pulls these guys aside and says, hey, listen, don't fear those who kill the body. He's probably referring to the religious leaders that are getting ready to turn their wrath on the disciples right after our Lord's ascension. Why does Jesus say that we shouldn't fear people who, who want to kill us? Well, he goes on in verse 4 because that's all they can do. Now, we might immediately say, well, that's quite a bit, you know. Um, it's kind of a big deal. But really it isn't. You know, we here, especially in the West, we have a view of death that Christians in other parts of the world don't really share. For us, many of us do fear death. For many of us, it's like, man, I, I don't want to die right now. I got a lot of living to do. There's a lot of things on my bucket list that hasn't been accomplished yet. There's so much I want to do. And, and I'm just, there are believers in other parts of the world. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The quicker you can get us out of this, the better. If you want to take me home today, take me home today. So Christianity looks different in different parts of the world. And for us, we have to remember, folks, we don't fear anyone that could possibly take our life. Because for us as a believer in Christ, that's payday. That's the ultimate payday. Jesus said it very clearly in John 5. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He is actually passed from death to life. If you're a believer in Christ this morning, you've already passed through death into life. So yeah, somebody may pop in that door and bust off two caps at me. And I'm done, right? Thank you very much. You just sent me to the glorious payday. That's the idea that Jesus had. That's the idea the apostle had. But Jesus goes on here and he makes it very clear. So don't fear those who can kill you. But he makes it very clear that we are to absolutely fear someone else. Who? Verse 5 says, I'm going to warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Who has the authority to determine whether we are in heaven or in hell? Satan doesn't. For many years, people thought that Jesus was telling people to actually fear the devil. 
But yet we don't find that anywhere in the rest of the scripture. Jesus never tells us to fear the enemy. Why? Because the enemy's already defeated. He's already been defeated in Christ. He has no authority or power over the believer. Satan will not be the one to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. Your faith in Christ will do that. And ultimately, the great judge, the creator of heaven and earth, he is the judge. There's only one who will determine whether you're in or you're out. There's only one who has authority to cast you into hell. So if I could paraphrase what I think Jesus is saying here, he's basically looking at his disciples and saying, hey friends, listen, don't fear those who will persecute you and kill you. Fear God. That's who you fear. Fear God. Now, for some of you, you may be hearing that thinking, fear God. That seems like an odd concept. Matter of fact, some people are even offended by the idea of the, the fear of God. Well, I'm going to tell you something this morning. The fear of God, that term, fear of God or fear of the Lord, which I believe they're synonymous terms, and I'm going to kind of use them interchangeably this morning. Those two terms are used over 100 times in our Bible. I tend to believe that when something is mentioned over and over and over in the Scriptures, that's something we ought to give good attention to. If something's hardly ever mentioned in the Scriptures, or maybe it's mentioned one time, I don't give as much attention to that. I call it majoring on the minors. We've got to be careful that we don't major on the minors, that we major on the majors. And if something is mentioned 100 times or more in the Scriptures, I think that's kind of a major doctrine. The fear of God or the fear of the Lord is mentioned over 100 times in the Holy Scripture. Let me give you just a few examples. I wish I had time to explore all these. I thought this might be a good Wednesday night study. We may delve into this a little deeper. But let me give you some examples out of the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 9, probably one of the most famous passages we find in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So wisdom begins with the fear of God, with the fear of the Lord. Psalms 112 verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Psalms 112, I'm sorry, Psalms 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. This is just a small sampling. We can go on and on and on this morning. And I want you to see not only is it, this isn't some Old Testament concept. Sometimes you, you talk about things like the fear of God or the fear of the Lord. People say, that's Old Testament stuff. We live in the New Testament. Okay, let me give you some New Testament examples. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his second letter, and he says in chapter 5, Therefore, <clears throat> knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So he's saying, because we walk in the fear of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, that's what motivates us to preach the gospel. That's what motivates us to persuade other people to believe this gospel because of the fear of the Lord. He goes on in chapter 7 of that same book. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord, or in the fear of God. So in other words, he says there is no holiness. We can't bring holiness to completion without cleansing ourselves from sin and defilement, and we do so. What motivates us to do that? The fear of God, the fear of the Lord. The author of Hebrews, he doesn't use the exact same language, but in chapter 12, the author of Hebrews says, Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The author of Hebrews is trying to put a little fear into these Hebrew Christians. Remember that, that, that the pillar of fire on the mountain? Yeah, that's our God. You should walk in reverence and awe. Acts chapter 9. You may want to turn to Acts chapter 9 because we, and we are going to come back to Hebrews 12 as I close today. Acts chapter 9 verse 31. Luke tells us that the church throughout all Judea and, and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit the church multiplied. We're going to come back to this passage in a minute. But for now I just want you to see Folks, over and over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, this walking in the fear of God, walking in the fear of the Lord, it's a big deal. But what exactly does it mean? What does it mean to say, I'm walking in the fear of God? That term, fear of God, has become kind of a pun for a lot of us. Come on, the fear of God, I mean, boy. 
What do we tell somebody when we say that? We mean we, we, we're gonna, you're going to straighten up because you're going to be fearful here in just a minute of my response. That's really not too far off from the biblical term here, fear of God. Now, I want to make it very clear. <coughs> Nowhere does the Bible tell us that we need to live our lives every day with one eye on the sky, right? You know, I, oh, I hope I don't step over the line. Ooh, if I say a bad word or I think a bad thought or I do something I shouldn't do, you know, God's like Thor with his hammer, just ready to <coughs> and bring down wrath and judgment. That's not the fear of God. God does not want us to live that way, not at all. How did the Old Testament saints, how did they walk in the fear of God? How did the, the Lord, the Lord's disciples, the first century church, how did, how did true believers throughout the centuries, how do they walk in the fear of the Lord? That's the question I really want to tackle this morning. Before I do, let me side note here for just a second. Did I mention I'm going on vacation? <clears throat> I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Every year I go on vacation, I, I started this little uh, tradition years ago. I always research a book to take with me on vacation, and my goal is to read through that book while I'm on vacation. It's usually, it's always some type of theology book or uh, some type of Bible study book. This year, I came across a book that I'm super excited about. It's called Truth on Its Head, Unusual Wisdom in the Paradoxes of the Bible by Warren Wiersbe. It may sound boring, but it's not. I got into the first chapter this week. I always usually read the first chapter to see if it's really something I want to take with me on vacation. And I was wow. Hey, this is great. Two reasons. One, it's written very well, but it also tied in very well with what I wanted to preach this morning. Um, you're probably going to be hearing more about this book in the future because I really think this might be a good study for us to tackle in the future. But as I was reading the first chapter of this book, it coincided so well with what Jesus is teaching his disciples in this passage. I wanted to share some of that with you this morning. So I, I never want to plagiarize somebody else's work. So I'm giving Warren Wiersbe some credit for some of the things that I'm saying to you this morning. It's right out of chapter one in that book. But what really grabbed my attention was in the very first chapter of that book, Wiersbe makes a very compelling case that to fully understand the fear of the Lord, we must first understand the joy of the Lord. Matter of fact, he goes on to say this, the joy of the Lord and the fear of the Lord must be replaced by the joyful fear of the Lord. I love that. I'm going to share with you this morning how he came to that conclusion in the scriptures. I want to share with you this morning how we can walk, and it sounds like it's a paradox, how can we walk in the joyful fear of the Lord? Let's start with talking about the joy of the Lord for just a second. I can't talk about the joy of the Lord without thinking of that song we used to sing in the kids' church. Remember? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Can anybody else sing that? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's a hard song to learn. <laughs> that is entirely, that is the entire song. Then you just, we just sang that over and over and over. My career, maybe it was an AG thing, I don't know. But either way, it always made me feel like we need to be one of those Jewish bar mitzvahs dancing around. You know, those joy, you know, anyway. That song is actually taken... From Nehemiah chapter 8, when Nehemiah says that to the children of Israel, he tells them that the joy of the Lord is your strength. But here's the problem. A lot of times, we Christians mistake the joy of the Lord for happiness. You need to be very, very, I need to be very clear this morning, and you need to understand this. Happiness and the joy of the Lord are two very different things. Happiness depends primarily on your happenings. So in other words, if the happenings around me are good, woohoo! If my happenings are not good, woohoo! But that cannot impact our Christian joy. The joy of the Lord is something very different. Think of it this way. Unsaved people can be very happy. I know some unsaved people that are very happy. At least they seem to be. They say they are. I know some atheists that claim to just love life and they're happy and everything's good. They have no knowledge of God whatsoever. They, they say they're very happy people. Unsaved people can experience happiness. I believe that. But only true believers know the joy of the Lord. 
Only true believers in Jesus Christ can experience this more, this deeper, more satisfying joy that really becomes the source of our strength. So for a believer, even when our happenings are not good, we have this thing deep down inside that says, it's okay, you're going to get through this. It's all right. I love you. I'm here with you. I'll be your strength. I'll be your shield. I'll be the high tower you can run to. This is going to be okay. That's the joy of the Lord. It's the best way I can describe it. Folks, the joy of the Lord is the, is the work of the Spirit in us. And if you're here this morning, and this is just kind of a side note, if you don't have that joy, you may not have the Holy Spirit. That's the honest truth. You may need to truly be born again where, where the Spirit work in your life and generate this spiritual joy in you. Now, what in the world does the joy of the Lord have to do with the fear of the Lord? Let me explain it this way. In this life that we're living, in this journey that we're on together, spiritual joy or the joy of the Lord without the fear of the Lord can lead us to be shallow and careless in our Christian walk. I've called this greasy grace Christians. Greasy grace Christians are those who are so happy they're not going to hell. Woo! So glad I've got fire insurance. I can live it up in this life. I can live any way I want to. I can, I can sin. I can, I can be a good person. I might even be a bad person at times. God knows I'm not perfect. I can just kind of live it out any way I want to. And praise God, I'm under grace. That's what I call greasy grace. I don't believe those people truly are born again. They have all the joy, but no fear. But let me give you another example on the opposite end of the spectrum that I believe is just as destructive. And that's living under the fear of the Lord without any joy. You ever know anybody that thinks the Christian life should be unfun? There's no fun to be had as a Christian. If there's anything that you're enjoying too much, sin. <laughs> that's the way they feel. Don't you indulge too much in that. Ooh, get ready. Some preachers preach this way. It's turned a lot of people off. It's a constant wrath of God coming down on you for every vile thought or every you know bad motivation or anything you say or do. It's like you're gonna burn. It's gonna burn bad. Huh. There's no joy in these people whatsoever. You know, I thought of this passage, I added it to my notes, maybe even this morning or maybe last night, I don't remember. I remember Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. And he's writing about wealthy people in the church. And he says, hey, tell the rich people in this present age, those who are rich, charge them not to be proud or haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I've come to believe it's okay to work hard and enjoy the things that God gives you to enjoy. It's all right to have some joy. Yeah, we don't want to be too focused on the world and all the things the world offers. We don't want to become materialistic and, and, and just so uh, worldly-minded that we're no heavenly good. But the flip side is, God is a God of blessing. And you know me, I'm not one of those get rich in Jesus and he wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and all that. I'm not into that. But I do believe God is a God of blessing. And sometimes he's going to honor obedience. He's going to love you. He's going to pour out blessing on you. And he says, enjoy it. I give you things to enjoy. So how in the world can we walk in the joy of the Lord and at the same time maintain a healthy fear of the Lord? It's about balance. I don't know if you like Rick Warren or not. I'm not a huge Rick Warren fan, but I have one of his books in my library. It's The Purpose Driven Life. And I think it's that book where he says, he actually closes at the end of that book. He says, um, if there were a ninth beatitude, it would be this. Blessed are the balance, for they will outlast all the rest. What we're really talking about here this morning is a balanced Christian walk. A balanced Christian walk. A walk with God that involves walking with Him in joy and in reverent fear. And yes, I want to drive this home this morning too. To walk in the fear of the Lord is to seek to live your life under His rule, under His Lordship, knowing that God does chastise those that He loves. Hebrews 12, 6 makes it very clear. The Lord chastises those that he loves. If I could put that in another term, the Lord punishes or 
The Lord will give you a good weapon when you need it. If you're a true child of God and you get to a season of your life where you begin to dabble in certain sin that you know is dishonoring to God, you start becoming comfortable with that sin. The moment you stop being at war with sin, you have a loving Heavenly Father who will do whatever it takes to bring you back to where you are. He loves you too much. You know this if you're a parent. I didn't do everything right as a, as a dad. I know that. My dad didn't do everything right as a dad, but I am thankful that my dad taught me. He actually taught me the fear of the Lord by teaching me a healthy fear for my dad. I have a very close relationship with my dad. But he taught me at a very young age, I'm going to tell you what's right and I'm going to tell you what's wrong. And when you cross the line, I will start with a gentle, loving correction. And if you don't heed it, get ready for the wrath. You will experience the fear of your dad. And I did. My siblings knew it. We knew that when we crossed a certain line or things went too far, he was lighting us up. I did the same thing with my kids. Again, I'm not a perfect dad. And I never beat my children. They might tell you they were beaten, but they don't beat <laughs> Believe me, they probably didn't get actually what they deserved. But they knew that there was a line that couldn't be crossed. And the moment they crossed that line, dad would swoop in and I'd light them up. I didn't do it because I'm a despot. I didn't do it because I'm power hungry. You know why I did it? I love them. I love them so much. I wanted good for them. I wanted them to be even a better person than I am. I wanted them to, to be successful in society. I wanted them to hold down good jobs. I wanted them to get a good education. More than anything else, I wanted them to walk with Jesus. So I had to correct them. Folks, that is exactly what the author of Hebrews is saying. We serve a loving Heavenly Father. And I kind of like to use this analogy too. Get away from the father-child relationship. Think about a husband-wife relationship. God is a faithful husband who loves his wife. And whether we like this image or not, we are kind of like a, a wife who has a wandering eye. We are like a spouse who's constantly checking out those people walking down the street. That one looks pretty good. You know, oh man, I'd like to get to know them a little bit more. That's just kind of our natural tendency. We are drawn to sin. But we have this loving husband who says, hey, back over here. Look at me. Don't look over there. There's nothing good for you over there. Come with me. And there are times where we kind of pull away as that unfaithful wife. And I'm just like, no, no, no. No, no. This, this one's looking even better. And in those moments, God says, he grabs us by the arm and he gives us a good heart and yank. He does whatever it takes to bring us back in his presence where we need to be. To me, that is walking in the fear of God. I'm fearful of those moments. I'm fearful of them. Oh, praise God. I'm thankful for them. I want to show you this in Scripture this morning. God wants you to walk in holy fear, but he wants you to do this joyfully. Now, Acts chapter 9 passage, if you want to look at it, I want to read it one more time. Luke tells us that the church in Judea, the church had just taken off. The day of Pentecost has happened. That in the next few years, people are getting saved like crazy. They're getting added to the kingdom. The church is exploding. He tells us the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, they had peace and they were being built up. It means they were growing and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. Luke tells us that the church was walking in the fear of the Lord, but what, did it, what was the manifestation of that? Were they walking around? Oh, sure, hope God doesn't kill us. Hope he doesn't bring down his wrath. No, it tells us they were walking in peace. They were experiencing comfort. It tells us that the church was actually growing and multiplying. You know, someone might say, Steve, you better be careful preaching this fear of the Lord stuff. A lot of folks don't like it. Other folks think it's old school preaching. It's old covenant preaching. We'll be preaching that fear of God. Here's what I would say. Like it or not, that's never really determined how I preach. But more importantly, that's the way the apostles preached. They preached and taught that we are to walk in the fear of God. And look what happened. People experienced peace. They experienced comfort. And the church grew. Let me give you another example. We'll jump back into the Old Testament. 
I know most of you are familiar with God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, brought them across the Red Sea, parted the waters, right? They come across. The Egyptians come after them. Water comes back, wipes out the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 14 says, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. What you find here is that they, they were in awe. Wow, did you see what God just did to the Egyptians? Oh my goodness. And it tells us they actually feared God in that moment. What did that fear cause them to do? Well, if you read on into chapter 15, it tells us that they started dancing. And they started singing. And they started praising God. The fear of the Lord did not move them into hiding holes, to hide in caves, or to walk in dread of his judgment. The fear of the Lord led them to joyful worship. To joyfully worship the God who delivered them. Now go back to Luke chapter 12. I want to wrap up with this. Jesus clearly says here, do not fear. Don't fear those who kill your body. But he tells us to emphatically fear God, the only one who has authority to cast your soul into hell. Fear God. But then I want you to look back at verse 6. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many Sparrows. If I could paraphrase this again, Jesus says, don't fear man. Fear God. But do so joyfully rejoicing that you are his prized creation. God loves you above everything else. There's nothing he created in his image but us. You know, as a kid growing up, and I've said this before, I don't think this was really preached, but this was the message I heard. I walked in the fear of the Lord, but everything I did wrong, I, I immediately was unsaved. You know, I'm saved one day, unsaved the next, saved one day. I got saved almost every Sunday night at church for a long time. I've come to believe now that when I sin against God, when I make a willful decision to do what I know is wrong, it's not my salvation I lose, it's the joy of my salvation. And if you question that, just go to Psalms 51. I meant to put it up here this morning. I forgot to. After David had sinned with Bathsheba, he committed adultery. He impregnated a married woman. And then he had a husband murdered on the battlefield so he could have her. In his repentant moment, he penned the words of Psalm 51. And you know what he says? I think it's there around verse 12. Lord, please restore. He doesn't say restore to me my salvation. Lord, please restore to me the joy of my salvation. When we knowingly and willfully sin against God, we lose the joy of our salvation. We lose all that warm, fuzzy presence that we enjoy so much. That's what I've grown to be more fearful of than anything else now. I don't want to lose that. I want to experience that peace and that comfort. I want to experience His presence in powerful ways. And when I sin against Him and I don't repent of that quickly, I lose that. This is definitely a message that church in action needs to hear. Every church needs to hear. I need to hear. Folks, we need to develop a healthy fear of our Lord, which turns us from the sin and the evil of this world and leads us to walk in children of life. But we have got to do this with joy and hope and confidence, knowing that when we fail him, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us and to restore us to righteousness. One last quote, Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, thanks to paradox, reverent fear, and joyful blessing can be friends, and they work together to make each believer a maturing and faithful child of God. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you. I, I want us to grow in the Lord. And in order to do that, we need to learn to walk in the joyful fear of the Lord. Gracious God, I pray that this message this morning resonates with every person here, every person listening as it has with me. I, I just thank you for the way you've spoken this to my heart even this week. 
It is so easy in this world we live in, Lord, to get distracted, get our eyes on worldly things. It is so easy to give in to the lust of the flesh or the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, as your word says, to covet. Lord, it is so easy to fall into this trap of greasy grace, thinking that your grace is so wonderful we can live any way we want to. When the Apostle Paul himself said, should we sin more that grace should abound? God forbid. So Lord, I pray that this message is spoken powerfully to your church this morning. I pray that each one of us would search our own hearts, confess whatever sin needs to be confessed. Lord, I pray that you would restore the joy of our salvation to those that have lost it this morning. To those that are maybe walking in just a dryness in their heart right now, I'm asking God that you restore that joy and that just perhaps that needs to begin with repentance. So may they search their hearts diligently today and in the days ahead. And I pray, Lord, as we leave here this morning, we would walk in this joyful fear of the Lord. Not scared of your, your wrath. Lord, wrath has already been paid. Jesus took on our wrath. We know that. But I pray that we walk in fear of being separated from that sweet joy that we experience in your presence. Only then can we mature and grow in the people that you've called us to be. And Lord, lastly, I do want to pray for those this morning that don't know the joy of the Lord at all because they have not come to know the Prince of Peace, the, one that, the only one that can bring them true eternal peace. And if there is anybody here this morning that doesn't know you personally and powerfully, God, I'm asking that you just pour out your great, amazing grace upon their hearts today. As we sung this morning, lead them to the cross right now. As our heads are bowed and everybody's eyes are closed, I do want to, as I always do, I want to close with that question. Is there anybody with us this morning that say, you just described me. I know in my heart of hearts, I'm not a born-again believer. I know that if I were to die today, heaven would not be my eternal home. I'm not going to ask you to come join me, but I do need to know where you're at so I can follow up with you later. Is there anybody that say, please pray for me, Steve? Pray, pray with me this morning before we go. I am an unbeliever and I need to be born again. Anyone, quickly slip your hand up. We can put it right back down. All right, stand with me if you would. <clears throat> well, gracious God, once again, thank you for your word. And thank you for these people that are here to hear it. For those that are tuning in online, once again, I'm praying that the power of the Spirit just works to bring about good fruit through this preaching. I pray that you've been honored in it. I pray that I have accurately and powerfully proclaimed this word. Um, Lord, help us to walk out of here and live it now. And I want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity for the ladies to get together this afternoon and enjoy this lunch they're about to enjoy. Thank you for the time and the effort that's been put into planning for it and, and having it. I just pray it's a wonderful time uh, of fellowship and growth for our church. Bless each lady this morning. Bless each believer here today. I just pray once again that you'd help us to go out here and be the salt and light you've called us to be. Help us to be your church in action. We love you. We ask all this in the power of Jesus' name. And one last time, all God's people said. Amen. God bless you, folks. Ladies, enjoy your lunch. Okay.